Greetings all, I'm Aaron Mills, and welcome back to Legacy of the Pink Panther, a 12-part retrospective on the films and cartoons of the Pink Panther franchise. Last time, we talked about the movie A Shot in the Dark, and how production of that film was a nightmare for Peter Sellers and Blake Edwards, to the point that the two of them vowed that they would never work with each other ever again. This, however, proved to be untrue, as they re-collaborated for 1968's The Party. However, the production of The Party kind of threw a monkey wrench into the works of the plans of the Mirish Corporation, who had been bankrolling the Clouseau films to this point. The Mirish Company was founded by Walter Mirish and his two brothers, Marvin and Harold. Walter had been a producer with Allied Artist Pictures in the 1940s and 50s, producing such films as Bomba the Jungle Boy and The First Texan. The brothers formed the company in 1957 and signed a 12-picture deal with United Artists, which was eventually changed to a 20-picture deal. United Artists bought the company wholesale in 1963, but the Mirishes continued to produce films and TV shows under other corporate names. Despite Blake Edwards and Peter Sellers repeatedly stating that they would never work with each other again, Walter still wanted to go ahead with a third Clouseau film, and he kept repeatedly asking Sellers to reprise the role. Sellers repeatedly refused. But Walter decided to press on anyway with a script by Frank and Tom Waldman, and after Blake Edwards declined the job, putting Bud Yorkin in the director's seat. As for Clouseau himself, the company decided to go ahead and cast Alan Arkin, who had just come off the company's hit Cold War comedy, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming. Despite his repeated protests about never wanting to play Clouseau again, when Sellers got word that the Mirishes were going ahead with another movie anyway, he went back to them saying that only he could play Clouseau, and that he would do the film if he got final script approval. Walter refused. So was Sellers right? Could only he play Clouseau and thus make the movie a hit? Well, let's see what happens as we watch Alan Arkin step into the shoes of Inspector Clouseau. After the obligatory animated opening titles, this time featuring the animated Inspector character created by DePatty Freeling Enterprises, more on that in a later episode, we waste no time jumping straight into Exposition Central as we drop in on a press conference at 10 Downing Street in London. Police Commissioner Braithwaite, what information can you give us? I have no comment. Sir Charles, is the same gang that pulled off the great train robbery involved? I'm afraid that's confidential. Sir Charles, could you tell us what came of your meeting with the Prime Minister this morning? Well, all I can say at this time is that we are bringing in someone to take command of the entire investigation. An outsider? Well, uh, yes. Isn't that rather a slap in the face for Scotland Yard? In an emergency of this magnitude, one must overlook such minor considerations as to whose nose is out of joint, mustn't one? Even if it is one's own nose. I don't think that calls for any comment. Are you right, Sir Charles? When do you expect this man to arrive, Sir Charles? Oh, yeah, we're not wasting any time getting to Clouseau. And honestly, this isn't exactly an encouraging introduction. This particular bit seems to go on for way too long, and it's really not all that funny. I don't know, maybe things get funnier once Clouseau is actually interacting with someone. Inspector Clouseau. Shh. I'm Weaver, your opposite number. Oh, that's Shocker, he's Special Brown. Hello, sir. I'm delighted you to be here. You know I'm here in this secret mission? Uh, yes, well, if you'd like to come along, we have a car waiting. But I've not yet cleared customs. Oh, that's all been arranged, sir. Standard VIP treatment, you say. Ah, but I'm no VIP. And therefore, I must go through customs like any humble French tourist. Honestly, sir, I assure you. That is my cover, you fool. Have you anything to declare? No, no, I'm just your average, typical French tourist on a humble English vacation. Good. Well, can I see your passport and your deep parking ticket? Yes, of course. I do it here. I never travel with that. Oh, 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 oh. Come along, Nassim, please. You have not yet seen my passport! I, I have this... Hello! Uh-huh. Okay, then. Moving on. We know that the two and a half million pounds stolen <laughs> stolen in our great train robbery are being used as operating capital for a far more ambitious crime. Be now, with a plot like this where there's a lot of exposition to be doled out, you really need to have something going on on screen so your audience doesn't get bored. Ideally, in a comedy, you have something funny going on but you need to balance that in such a way so that it doesn't distract from the information that your audience needs to know later. Let's see how this movie handles it. Bigger than two and a half million. Well, we seem to be dealing with very greedy people. Greedy and ruthless. You are the fourth to be placed in charge of this operation in the past six months. 
Well, it seems that Scotland Yard has had a run of unfortunate luck. But despite our unfortunate luck. Hilarious. I really don't get why they thought this bit would be funny. It's just Clouseau randomly moving around the room, moving the things on Sir Charles' desk while Sir Charles himself tries to cope. There's no reason for Clouseau to move, so the shtick makes no sense and is more confusing rather than amusing. In any event, Sir Charles states that they were able to apprehend a dozen of the gang members from the Great Train Robbery, including three of the ringleaders. However, two of them have escaped, leaving only one in custody. The other was Steve Frey. And the one still remaining in custody is Addison Steele. Perhaps I should question that pleasant-looking Mr. Steele. But it turns out there's another problem, one which is the reason why Clouseau was asked to head the investigation. No, but I have to tell you that we have recently discovered a security leak in this very department. In this very department? That is why you are here. The thought was, since you couldn't be the traitor, we can trust you. But you... But you must trust no one. The viper in our bosom could be anyone. Anyone? I suspect everyone. Good. You will report only to me. And what makes you think I trust you? Clouseau heads for the prison to talk to Addison Steele, who is apparently working as the prison barber. There, Clouseau has an interesting encounter with Steele's current customer. Do look after him, won't you, Steele, oh dear? I doubt if your razor is sharp enough for the famous Inspector Clouseau. Smart young criminal is the warden's son. Quite a joker. The warden son, eh? Should have known better than to reveal my identity to a hardened criminal like you. We hardened criminals follow your career with great interest, Inspector. Oh, oh, oh. As I yours. Sit down, I'll give you a shave. And now, since we are becoming so charming, perhaps you will tell me everything you know about the great train robbery. Eh? I don't know nothing. He who don't know nothing knows something, eh? Wait a minute, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yep, believe it or not, grammatically speaking, Clouseau's correct. Well, if you want to know about the mastermind, don't talk to me. Talk to Johnny Rainbow. And uh, who is this Johnny Rainbow? Well, it's just a code name, really. Uh, none of us ever met him face to face. Because Clouseau sent the guard out of the room, Steele takes the opportunity to knock Clouseau out and effect his own escape from prison. Later, Superintendent Weaver gives Clouseau some specially requested equipment. I think you'll be pleased with these items that you requested. Our chaps took some liberties with your specifications that I think would delight you. Ah, uh, the smoke signal matches that you asked for? Oh, yes. A wonderful thing yeah. to have them. Now, uh, this you must watch very carefully. Looks like an ordinary cigarette lighter, but it is, in fact, a high-intensity laser beam transmitter. Uh, oh, uh, oh, yes, just what the doctor ordered there. Thank you. Now, this is another scene which goes on for far too long and brings everything to a halt. And it wouldn't be a big deal if the scene were actually funny, but quite honestly, it isn't. I mean, even the gags are more groan-worthy than anything that's going to actually make you laugh. And really, the only point of this scene is to set up gags further on down the line. So, since we know that, let's move on. Weaver invites Clouseau to dinner, where he meets Lisa Morell, Weaver's au pair, who, for some reason, insists on meeting with Clouseau alone later. They're interrupted by Weaver, who introduces his extremely Scottish wife to Clouseau. If it's an example of your maid, then your wife must really be something. Oh! Could this lovely creature be your famous French friend? Oh, Weaver, how could you? Well, I have no boy, not in years. <laughs> okay, that one was funny. Mrs. Weaver hauls Clouseau off to the Scottish Festival in a sequence that just screams, they paid us a ton of money to make this movie, but we have to shoot a major sequence here in return. 
Anyway, one of the escaped gang members attempts to assassinate Clouseau, but he's saved by one of the gadgets from the previous scene, which goes off by accident, killing the assassin. Frank Waldman would actually revisit this basic concept further on down the line with Blake Edwards in a much longer and funnier sequence in The Pink Panther Strikes Again. But that's a topic for another episode. After another prolonged scene where Mrs. Weaver attempts to seduce Clouseau, and Alan Arkin admittedly has some wonderfully deadpan snarky lines, Clouseau is saved by the arrival of a police officer who has been sent to fetch him. The gang attempts to kill him again, but hold off when Clouseau has another chance encounter with the warden's son. Inspector Clouseau, isn't it? Leave it. Let's get out. Hey, Clyde Hargreaves. Blackpool Prison? Oh yes, the son of the warden, the one with the warped sense of humor. And you still need a haircut. I don't think you'll find many laughs in there, Inspector. <laughs> There is a time for laughing and a time for not laughing, and this is not one of them. Yeah. Clouseau gets called on the carpet by Sir Charles, but the scene goes nowhere except for Clouseau to leave the plum pudding he won at the Scottish Festival at Sir Charles's club. At lunch the next day, through a truly ridiculous leap in logic, Clouseau decides the gang will attempt to get to him through the plum pudding, thus prompting a call out to the bomb squad. Let me repeat that. Clouseau is convinced that the gang is going to try to kill him by putting a bomb in the plum pudding he won at the Scottish Festival, which has been in his possession from the time that he won it until he went to Sir Charles's club. And the hell of it is, he's right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, a deadly transistorized mini bomb. Looks like one of those cyanide capsules. Yeah, it does. A cyanide capsule. Well, somebody certainly seems determined to see you dead. Yes, but who? Well, I mean, it could be anyone of that blasted Scottish hoop to do. No, yeah, but I didn't let this out of my sight till I got here to your club. Uh, weren't there any clues on Frenchy Lebec that we might be able to oh. use? These matches, which I found in his coat pocket. Let me see those. Good. Bring that man in for questioning. You shot him last night. Oh, yes. <laughs> the cue to arms. Uh, Inspector, perhaps we ought to have a look at this place. No sooner I... said than done. Uh. On his way to the Tudor Arms, Clouseau encounters a woman on the road who is having car trouble. After ruining the engine, Clouseau takes her to the inn, where it turns out that the innkeeper is, in fact, the woman's uncle. Oh, God. I had hoped I could go through my entire video career without having to use this stupid meme, but unfortunately it's appropriate here and I've got nothing funnier for it. So, say, what do you think of the situation, Admiral Akbar? It's a trap! Yes, it is. The woman convinces Clouseau to let her take some pictures of him, then says she wants some full figure shots. After Clouseau changes in the bathroom, he comes out to find a completely different woman on his bed. Downstairs, the first woman and her uncle develop the pictures, while the blonde knocks Clouseau out again, giving the three of them a chance to take a mold of Clouseau's face. When Clouseau begins to have a waking dream, the girls egg him on while the innkeeper hides under the bed. This proves to be a bad idea when the bed collapses, crushing him to death. So Charles is naturally unhappy that nearly every member of the gang Clouseau has encountered winds up dead, rather than being, you know, alive to give information. So Weaver suggests sending Clouseau to the funeral of the first assassin to see if he can get information on what the gang is planning, since they're bound to attend. Again, the funeral sequence really serves no purpose but to set up a string of gags which result in half the village being ticked at Clouseau, who chase him down at the funeral, resulting in him getting rescued by Lisa, who turns out to not actually be an au pair. Some police woman. <laughs> Listen, if you don't believe that I'm a member of Interpol, go in and ask them. You, a member of the International Police? Yes. Don't make me laugh. I, I arrest you in the name of the Queen. This crook is Lieutenant Morel of Interpol. Who the devil are you? Lisa and Clouseau attempt to fire a microphone via arrow into the hideout of the gang. Unfortunately, it goes right through the window and into an apartment of the next building over, thus giving Clouseau an earful of dialogue from an old Western movie involving a bank robbery. Meanwhile, we finally find out the identity of the mastermind of the heist, Johnny Rainbow. Who's there? Open up, please. Not until you show me your mother. Okay. Crusoe, have it! 
Son. Man. Use a dead ringer for clues, huh? Yeah, it just goes to show what one can do with five bobs worth of plastic, a few photographs, and the take from the great train robbery. You're Johnny Rainbow. Johnny Rainbow. That's it, fellas. Switzerland is the bank vault of the world. And on Saturday afternoon, we are going to rob the biggest banks in 13 of the biggest cities in the country. And who gets blamed? Inspector Jacques. Clouseau. How are you going to be in 13 different banks all at the same time? <laughs> I'm not. You are. Good. Uh, so listen. my guest still. Huh. Oh, that's great. How do the eyes look? Perfect, even from here. It's gonna work, Clyde. I do not like this joke. Cut me out. What do you mean? Me too, it's dodgy. No hard feelings, huh? Wait a minute. I know that guy. Where the hell have I seen him before? I'm known as the Master. And as you see, I speak to you from within the Matrix. Proof, if any be needed that not only qualified people can enter here. Oh, good lord. Now Doctor Who's popularity has gone so massive that it's actually warping time and space and crossing over with things in the past. No, as a matter of fact, I need a couple of bribe boys to do another little job for me. Clouseau. To kill Clouseau will be my pleasure. But our ruin. Now look, listen, once we've made the haul, I want Clouseau running around trying to explain his innocence to all those eyewitnesses. No, my friend, do not kill Clouseau. Kidnap him. And, and while you and your, and your cadets are holding me prisoner, Ringo and one eye and the half breed are, are robbing the bank and lefty and what's his name are, 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 are shooting up the hotel lobby and the one with the squeaky voice, the one with the squeaky voice is up in the room. Obviously, the police don't believe or even understand Clouseau's ramblings and throw him out. He meets up with Lisa, who has been watching the bank, and the two drive a short distance away, thinking the gang will strike if they aren't around. Meanwhile, the two goons who wanted out of the main plan try to affect their kidnapping of Clouseau. Hands up, high. All right, turn around. Drop your hands now. Hey, what's up, Weaver? Yeah, don't worry about the master. He'll just turn into a poorly CGI'd snake and steal Eric Roberts' body later. But if you were paying attention, you now know that Weaver is the traitor within Scotland Yard's ranks. Apparently, they found evidence on the two crooks that the gang was planning something in Switzerland, so Clouseau boards a train for Zurich with Lisa not far behind. But it turns out Weaver is on the train, and if you needed confirmation he's the traitor, he has the same tattoo as the rest of the gang. Weaver, after a truly bizarre sequence where he and Clouseau play jacks, throws Clouseau off the train, but Clouseau's dumb luck saves him. Weaver puts on one of the masks, taking Clouseau's place. He's met by Hargreaves, and the two swap out, with Hargreaves taking the Clouseau mask. Hargreaves and Weaver hold a meeting with the managers of the banks the gang has targeted, informing them to disregard any instructions that don't come from either of them. Meanwhile, Clouseau tries to get a hold of Scotland Yard, but falls victim to that oldest of gags, a lack of exact change. That's all the change I have. I've been trying to make this call for an hour. Wait, wait. My mother has just come by. Mother, have you got any money? Yes, very good. Thank you very much. Oh, she, luckily she had some change with her. A miraculous 
occurrence that she didn't tell me about. Ugh. Let's just get on with the heist. Convincing the bank manager to load all the money into the truck, Hargreaves and his crew drive off with it. But this is complicated by Clouseau arriving, clueless as usual, trying to get more change for the phone. Oh, no, 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 not my bank. It's amazing. How is it everyone in Zurich knows who I am? The inspector took full responsibility, so all our money has been loaded into the truck. Uh, that's perfect, though, right? It's part of the plan. Plan? What, what plan? Your plan. Eh. No, my plan is to cash a check and make a telephone call to London. The gang transfers the money from their fake bank trucks to fake Lint chocolate trucks and heads for the Lint factory, where they plan to smuggle the money out wrapped up as chocolate bars and then via boat out of the country. However, they don't notice that one of the security guards sees what they're up to and grabs a bar for himself. Yes, this is a plot point. Clouseau is, of course, arrested, but the security guard is either brought in by the police or goes to them voluntarily. The movie never makes it clear which. And he not only fingers Clouseau, but Weaver as well. Weaver puts on a mask and tries to kill Clouseau. Weaver and Clouseau fight, and the security guard accidentally clubs Weaver to death. Meanwhile, on the boat... Okay, so Lisa got captured by the gang... somehow and they have taken her prisoner for some reason. Moving on. Clouseau explains what happened on the radio, which of course spawns the biggest mad rush for chocolate bars since Willy Wonka sent out the golden tickets. Driving around the city, Clouseau spots Steele who mistakes him for Weaver. Eventually Steele realizes Clouseau is who he is and after a chase, hauls Clouseau out to the boat where he's taken prisoner and reunited with Lisa. Eventually, the gang does decide to kill them. However, Clouseau has a genuinely good idea involving one of the stupid gadgets from earlier. Okay, you two, let's go. As a result of this piece of genuine brilliance on Clouseau's part, the boat starts to sink and the gang abandons ship, leaving the money behind. Clouseau and Lisa are rescued by Sir Charles and presumably point the police in the direction of the gang. Or they could have just as easily escaped. Who knows? And really, who cares? Because this movie definitely doesn't. And so Clouseau makes his goodbyes and flies to Paris, where he gets a rather unwelcome surprise on the plane. Inspector. Yes? Mrs. Weaver. The Widow Weaver thanks to you, Inspector. No, no, miss, listen, don't do anything that you'll be sorry for me. For our first night alone together in that naughty Paris of yours. Inspector Clouseau. Looks like Peter Sellers was right. While there's a few genuinely funny moments and the entire cast is actually very good, this movie itself is a mess. Scenes go on for too long, the pacing is sluggish, and most of the shtick doesn't actually work. Alan Arkin's take on Clouseau is interesting and unquestionably his own, but mostly results in him shouting at everybody and not really up to the same level of slapstick as Sellers. Additionally, Bud Yorkin's direction just isn't right for this material, playing everything more low-key than it really should. I couldn't find any hard numbers on how successful this film was at the box office, but considering this movie is largely unknown today, yeah, it's not hard to assume that it didn't really do very well. In fact, there's still a long-running debate between die-hard Pink Panther fans as to whether or not this movie should be included in the series at all. Seeing that Blake Edwards didn't direct, Peter Sellers didn't star, and Henry Mancini didn't do the music. Now, as far as MGM is concerned, because they are the current copyright holders on the franchise, it is part of the series, and was recently included as part of their Ultimate Pink Panther Collection box set that they put out a few years ago. 
However, the term Ultimate Collection is actually a misnomer because there is one film in the series that MGM does not own the rights to. And that's the one we're going to take a look at next time. As we see the return of Peter Sellers to the role of Clouseau, the return of Blake Edwards to the director's chair, the return of Henry Mancini's music, and the return of the Pink Panther. I'm Aaron Mills. Join me again next month as we continue our look at the legacy of the Pink Panther.